Sean, Alex Ovechkin keeps scoring goals. And uh, I think some of us thought maybe he would stop because he wasn't scoring that many goals earlier this season. I'm guilty of it, I think. And I'm like tisk tisking myself. Are you? You should tisk tisk yourself. But I never look back, Dan. I always look forward. And that's my way of saying I believe Dovi was washed up as well. And he's proven <laughs> us both wrong as well as a lot of other people. I, 30 goals as many times as he's done it, it is absolutely mind-boggling. And the fact that he's put this hot streak together at the most important time of the season for the Washington Capitals makes it all the more impressive, right? He's not doing this in garbage time when people don't care and, and and things come a little bit easier. He's doing this in the middle of a dogfight for a playoff position in the Eastern Conference where there's still five teams left and, and every game is a huge game. You look the goal he scored last night, right? It's in a huge, huge game a game that they needed against Detroit, and, and he comes up big for his team, and now they're in one of the driver's seats again and in an Eastern race and a wild card race and a Metro race that nobody seems to want to put their foot on the throat of everybody else. Well, I, hold on. I don't know about that. The New York Islanders are, are starting to do that a little bit, and we'll get to that in a sec, but I, I think we got to give Ovechkin a little bit more of his due here. 18 30-goal seasons, and what – and he had eight goals in the first 43 games this season, and now 22 in his last 32. So it, it is really an impressive run. And he's asked, like, how are you doing this and all that? I, I don't, like, it's a great question because there could be an analytical answer to what he's doing now. Did he change his stick? Did he change the way he's moving around? Has he changed his look? All these things, like, how's he, has he analyzed why he wasn't scoring? All these things. And I, you want him to stand up on, on like, a, you know, on a step stool with a bullhorn and just scream, I'm doing this because I'm Alex Ovechkin, all right? And I score goals for a living, and that's what I do, and I'm doing it right now. But your point is well taken. He's doing it in the middle of a race here. And I think it was a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was last week or two weeks ago, and I'm going to give you the, a lot of credit here, Sean, that you said, watch these teams, the Penguins, the Capitals, the Islanders, the teams with recent playoff success, guys who have been around, they they rise to the occasion because they're the guys that they're the teams that know how to do it. Whereas a team like the Philadelphia Flyers and maybe even the Detroit Red Wings, even though they're not a young team, they're a veteran team, haven't been around long enough together as a group, don't have the pedigree that these other teams have, they may struggle. Well, look at the Flyers, look at the Red Wings a little bit now. And now you take a look at the Penguins and you take a look at the Caps. And the Caps need, you know, they needed that one against the Red Wings because they were starting to fall off a little bit. And Charlie Lindgren was great in that game, but you need your goalie to be great. And you take a look at the Islanders who have won five in a row. These teams with recent playoff successes are rising to the occasion in a race here that no one seems to have wanted for a long time. And so, Sean, I'm giving you credit for that statement, but I will say the New York Islanders look like a team. That wants it now. I love when you give me credit, and I deserve well, all the I deserve all the credit in the world. Always, I will say the one thing I've noticed about Ovi, and and you know, you talk about analytics and everything else, and, and you talked about movement. He is moving. He's not in the office anymore. Like that's not where his goals are coming from. Some of them are. But sometimes, he's, especially on the power play, he's on the top, you know, playing the point. He moves around. I think he's harder to defend. And and it's surprising because when he was in his prime, he never moved. When he was full of right. vim and vigor. And now he's older, like you and I, Dan. I, I don't have as much vim and vigor as I once did. Now he's moving around. When I want to just sit in the recliner and watch games, he's decided that he's going to wander all around the ice and shoot from different places instead of standing in one spot. And I think it's made him more dangerous. I have some vim, lacking on the vigor, I think, but uh, I don't even know what those things are. By the way, before we go on, Daryl Ray, Razor, the guy who has vim and vigor, he has a lot of vim and vigor, and he's got the best vocabulary in the National Hockey League. He's going to join us here in a little while. We'll talk Dallas Stars with him. The Stars have been, you know, listen, I mean, they're arguably the best team in the league right now with the way they're playing 15 wins in their last 18 games. So we'll get into all of that with Razor in a little while, but a little bit more here. I got to interrupt you for one second. We had a good argument last week about Sidney Crosby and Mario Lemieux and who was the ultimate penguin. Yeah. You just brought up Daryl and his vocabulary. Razor or Doc? Ooh. Oh, man. 
I'm going to have to go with Doc on this one. Doc calls the game, right? And I wish he was still calling the games. No offense to everybody else calling the games. We have a lot of good broadcasters, national broadcasters, but nobody has ever done it like Doc. And he has to talk a lot more than the color guy. And Razor's the color guy in Dallas uh, next to Josh Bogart. And like, Doc had to talk more, and his vocabulary is incredible. He's the best that's ever done it, arguably the best that's ever done it in any sport. So I got to give you Doc, and I don't think you're going to disagree. I'm not, but I'm a big SAT vocabulary guy, and Daryl sends me to the dictionary all the time. Yeah. <laughs> like Doc has a lot of words, but I know what all of them mean, but everyone is perfect for the moment in the game that he said it. But Daryl sends me to the online dictionary once every two or three games. That is true. But nobody said pitched, forked it up the ice like Doc. I mean, come on. The best. But listen, and he, I wish he was still around. Let's go back to the East here a little bit. So we got Ovechkin. Let's dive into the New York Islanders, okay? Because the New York Islanders, I thought were dead. I did. I just thought, I thought they were dead. And now... Not necessarily behind Ilya Sorokin, but behind Semyon Varlamov. They've come back to life. They've won five in a row, and they are sitting pretty solid, not no, as solid as one can be at the bottom of this East race, in third place in, in the Metropolitan Division right now. With Semyon Varlamov, 5-1 and one with a 9.39 save percentage and a 2.17 goals against in his last six starts, he started five of the last seven games, uh, it, it is actually remarkable what they've done here with Varley instead of Sorokin. And it's not to knock Sorokin. Sorokin's got a couple starts in. He's allowed six goals on his last 75 shots. Got one, two games, right? But Bar- Varlamov has just been terrific. I got to give the Islanders a lot of credit here. They look like the team. They go out and they beat the New York Rangers, right? I mean, that was a spicy one too against the Rangers too. That was that was a, that was a little fun. Would be great if those two teams would match up in the first round or any round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. We haven't seen that in forever, and it would be a great series, uh, just for you know the spiciness of it. Um, but I got to give the Islanders credit here because it didn't look like a team wanted it for a while here, and now the Islanders have jumped ahead with five wins in a row at the right time. They've gotten hot at the right time. Are they this good? I don't know, but they've gotten hot at the right time where some other teams have gone cold. Let me ask you this, Dan. What happened the last time the New York Islanders won five or more games in a row? Well, they dropped five in a row probably right after that. Six. Six, yeah. And they won't do that this time because there's not six games left. (laughs) That's true. But I'm not sold. Still, I'm not sold. And look, they looked great last night against the Rangers, who are the the class of the league and and haven't taken their foot off the gas at all, despite being in the the driver's seat for the President's Trophy and, and for the division and for everything else. They've played hard. They played hard against the Montreal team that had nothing to play for. You know, when you thought that might be a letdown game. They didn't let down. I don't think they let down last night. I thought that the Islanders took it to them, especially in the first period, and then they held on a little bit um, and and survived. But New York's the New York Islanders are way way too inconsistent for my liking. Yeah. Oh, well, listen, and I understand that. And you look at what they have remaining, right? So Thursday night they play the Montreal Canadiens. That that's it's at home. It's got to be a win. It absolutely has to be a win for them. The Canadians have not quit. I watched them against the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. They're still playing hard, okay? Not that I would expect any team to quit, but you know what I mean by that. They're still they're still going out and trying to play hard and, and, and set the culture, continue to set the culture there in Montreal. So it's not going to be an easy game, but the Islanders got to win that one. Saturday afternoon, they're at Madison Square Garden. What a game that's going to be here. That That's going to be a terrific one. The Rangers still have something to play for. They're three points up on the Hurricanes for first place in the Metro. They're three points up on the Bruins for first in the the conference. Forget about the President's Trophy. It's first in the conference that they want because if you – listen – if you finish first in your division, but you're second in the conference, you're win- you, you win a date with the Tampa Bay Lightning in the first round of the playoffs. And you want to avoid that if you can avoid it, right? You want to keep them on the other side. 
So the Rangers still have something to play for. They play the Flyers on Thursday. That's going to be a big one, I think, for both teams. And then the Islanders have the Devils on Monday, and they close it out Wednesday, a week from today, against the Pittsburgh Penguins. And that could be a huge game. So there's a lot here. And yes, I think the Islanders can be very inconsistent. And no, I'm not sold. I'm not sold, okay? Because how could I be? Because like you just said, the last time they won five in a row, they dropped six in a row. It's what they've done. They're an, they're they're a hot and cold team. But with so much on the line, I got to think that they can, they got to find a way to win against Montreal. They got to find a way to win against New Jersey. And to be honest, if they find one more point in the mix of all of that, it might be enough to get them in. So the Philadelphia Flyers thought that Montreal was a W. It was nine to three. Yeah, they they should net the the Philadelphia Flyers and listen, they're cooked. All right, I mean, can we agree on that? That they just look like a team that it just has nothing left. That they were a an impressive above expectation team for about seventy three seventy four games, uh, and, and now they've just completely run out of gas. They've got nothing left. They're getting blown out by Columbus. They're getting blown out by Montreal. And Torts has played the hard, the hard route with them. He's played the blame game with himself, not on any, not any of the players. He's played the blame game with some players, scratching Sean Couturier like he has without explaining it. He's gone easy on them, a little bit softer on them. It's not working. They're a team that just looks fried right now. I'm curious to see what they have when they come into Madison Square Garden Thursday night because. The Rangers are coming off of a loss, and the Rangers, like I was saying, they still have something to play for here, and they want it. They want to win the division. They want to finish first in the conference. I've talked to the guys about it, and the Flyers look like a team that's just got nothing left, Sean. Heartbreak Hill caved them in. Yeah. We talked about it last week, and we said that's what it was. They were, It's like trying to finish the Boston Marathon, you know, and you're not an elite runner. You haven't done it before, and all of a sudden you get to that hill, and it breaks you, and they're broken. I mean, yeah. they can't get a save. They can't score a goal. Like their defense is just a complete mess. I I, I see no way back for them. So, but I, my only point being is that Montreal might be a little bit more dangerous than we're giving them credit for. And, and I think I think the Islanders have a lot of work left to do. Um, there's no way that that game on Saturday is going to play out like the game did last night. The Rangers yeah. will be in a different frame of mind. They're not happy about some of the things that happened in that game. You know, Peter Peter Laviolette was very um, forthright in his displeasure after the game about the way that the Islanders played that game. Um, I don't know that I agree, but everybody's allowed their opinion. Um, but clearly, it will be a different game on Saturday. I can imagine that Pittsburgh game just being for everything, right? And that was the situation Pittsburgh was in last year, and they didn't do it. So uh, they're going to be motivated this year to do it. Um, It's certainly going to be a wild ride to the finish here in the East. Everything in the West, not so much. Maybe a little bit of seeding, but we we know who's in and who's out. Um, And now it's just jockeying for position. Yeah, well, we'll get to the West soon. And again, we got Daryl Ray coming up here in a few minutes talking Dallas Stars hockey with us. The one other team we got to talk about in the East is the Pittsburgh Penguins. And it's interesting, Sean. We just did this on NHL.com. You know, it it was April 8th. uh, It was one month from the trade deadline. Uh, One, you know, it's the one month anniversary of the trade deadline. And who had made the biggest impact? I, I wrote Jake Gensel because his impact on Carolina, I think, is unquestioned. You wrote Michael Bunting. I almost wrote Michael Bunting for that. I almost picked Bunting for that because his impact in Pittsburgh has been significant. He is produced for that team. And another team that looked completely dead, that looked like it was just going to play out the string here. And, well, they're not, right? I mean, they, they've found their way to get wins, points, and they're right in the thick of the race here. They've got four games left, but the schedule, Sean, the schedule for the Pittsburgh Penguins is hard. They do have their next three at home. Detroit, lot to play for. Boston, still got a lot to play for if they want first in the conference, right? Even in the division. Nashville, maybe not as much to play for, but never an easy game. I mean, Nashville clinched a playoff berth. And then they got the Islanders on the road. 
Not an easy schedule for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but they have four games left. And I wonder what the ma- I don't know what the magic number is in the East to get in the playoffs. Like I said, the Islanders, if they get five points out of the last eight, it might be enough. That's ninety points. I'm sorry, that's 92 points for the New York Islanders, and I think that would definitely do. Probably at 91 is what gets you in, and the Penguins have 84. So they need they have a lot of work to do here, but i got to give them a lot of credit for finding a way to get back in this. It helps when a team like the Flyers, we all expected the Flyers might eventually drop. They did. The Red Wings haven't taken it for the wild card so it opens up third it opens up the wild card and here are the pittsburgh penguins standing right there yeah and and it's been their big guys right that have done it and bunting and and i think that was the thing everybody panned that trade when it was made oh you gave jake gensel away right Uh, how could you do that well a you had to because he was a free agent to be and you're going to get nothing for him so you might as well get something and they got a functional player you know one that their gm Kyle Dubas knew well and he's fit right in and he's allowed them to kind of rebuild a little on the fly and still play meaning, meaningful games like the argument that you and I have always had do you tear it down to the studs in Pittsburgh or do you try and win because you owe it to those three guys who have given you so much have given that franchise so much and my argument has always been you need to try to win the whole time that they're there you can never ever set that threesome up to fail they need to be respected. They need to have an opportunity to go out on a high. And that move, because of the way that Bunting's played, has allowed them to do that. Um, and that's why I wrote, he's not the best player since the trade deadline. I think we all would say it's Gensel. You know, uh, Razor's going to talk a little bit about Chris Tanev, who is Mike Moriel's pick. You know, there there's other guys that are in there that certainly deserve credit. But to me, Bunting maybe has made the biggest impact on a team because yeah. that trade was a white flag and they didn't surrender. That's not in their DNA. It's certainly not in Mike Sullivan's DNA. It's not in Sidney Crosby's DNA. They're 6-0-3 in their past nine games. Sidney Crosby has seven goals and 10 assists in those games. Okay? Like, Sidney Crosby's driving this team and he has. He's gonna, he, If they make the playoffs, he's going to drive them into the playoffs. Here's the problem. The problem with the Pittsburgh Penguins is if they make it, they might have run. They, they might not have anything left when they get there, Okay. And it, it, whether they make it or they don't make it, they're still a stuck-in-the-middle team right now. The difference is they, they've gotten in a, a bump with Michael Bunting, partly because Jake Gensel wasn't playing for them. Like, they got a serviceable player who could they, who they could put in the lineup. Jake Gensel was still out of the lineup at the time they traded him, and he hadn't played in a while. So they got a guy who can not only produce and goes to the net and finds pucks there and can score, can actually he's an actual body they could use. So I think that made it, has made a big difference as well. But, yes, Malkin's played better. Brian Rust has been better. But, my goodness, Sidney Crosby. And Nedeljkovic, let's give him a lot of credit. He, he's he been good. Sidney Crosby's been out of this world. Listen, I don't think Sidney Crosby is in the Hart Trophy conversation, okay? Because th- this is an abnormal year. There's so many guys who've had balance of the season, better seasons, uh, you know, in terms of numbers and whatnot from Sidney Crosby. So I don't think in the end of the day, he will be a part of the Hart Trophy conversation, at least not the top four or top five. But we can certainly talk about most valuable player to his team, the definition of the award. I think you can at least say that Sidney Crosby has had that type of a season if they get in. It's just that with Kucherov and McKinnon and McDavid and Panarin and Matthews, you know, and Pasternak, like, I mean, there's just too many guys. I don't agree in the least. My my vote for NHL.com's trophy tracker, which will run next week, is due today. Today's the deadline. You going to vote it's for my, Crosby? It's my deadline, and I still haven't filed mine, but that's part of the benefit of being the guy in charge. Crosby's going to be in my top five. He could be as high as three. What he's done is Incredible. Incredible. I can't see him as high as three. They're still a middling team. They're an so 84-point team. They're in the playoff race because it's a bad race. They're Let's in the playoff honest. race because of Sidney Crosby. Yes, but Period. it's a bad Full race. Stop. He has no control It's a bad over race. That. He has no control over that. We Well, listen, he, he, he doesn't, and, and you're right that they're in the playoff race because of Sidney Crosby, and I, I agree with you 100% on that, but 
They're in the play. That they're not a very good team, but neither are Washington, neither's Detroit, neither's the Islanders, the Flyers. Like these aren't very good teams. It, a couple of years ago, it took a hundred points to get in the playoffs in the East. It's going to take ninety maybe this year. I mean, we've what a significant drop off there has been. We're talking about eighty four points being in the playoff race. Eighty four points is a middling season, and they're they're in. They could make the playoff. I mean, he's had a terrific he's driven them into it no question about it so you talk about valuable to his team yes but mcdavid's driven the oilers panarin's driven the rangers Pasternak's driven the bruins matthews has 66 goals for crying out loud and that's of course kucherov and and mckinnon are, are right there too like what about jt miller or quinn hughes or you know the, the in vancouver things like players like that like Josh Morris, he gets no love for it. He's been terrific with the Winnipeg Jets, right? I, I, I mean, Roman Yossi with Nashville. I'm not saying they're all better candidates than Crosby, but they're all they're all doing the same thing, and and they've driven their teams to be better too. First of all, you can't name two guys from the same team and say they're an MVP. Okay, fine. That's the whole McDavid <laughs> dry cycle thing. Always my issue with Quinn McDavid, Houston. right? But if you if you have a B that you're still not naming, he can't be the A. Like, is there a B on the Penguins? No. But that's why they're 20 points worse than a team like Vancouver. What's Vancouver done in the last 20 games? Eh, they've been okay. but They've played they 500 the first... hockey. Okay, well, they did the first 55 games don't count. 56 games, they count. They've done a lot. Of, they did a lot of good then to set themselves up to be like, hey, we're going to pace ourselves. Oh, so, we're going to pace ourselves. And look, they've done that. it because they've done what they've done lately because they don't have a goaltender with Demko Which being out. And yeah, hopefully he don't. comes back this week. But to me, I I can't discount what Crosby's done. And he hasn't done it alone. I would never suggest that. I think people that do say that, that are like, well, this is a Sidney Crosby put him on his back and he's the only reason they're in the playoffs. He's not, uh, or he's in a playoff position. He's not. You know, Ned has been a part of that. Other guys have been a part of that. But he is clearly driving the boat, and they are maybe in the bottom three or four in the East without him. Where is this Pittsburgh team without Sid? Yeah, bottom three or four in the East. Instead, okay. they're in the, you know, okay, they're 10 or 9, maybe 8. Anyway, let's see where they finish. We'll talk about it again next week. I'm Again, don't count me as this. I'm not saying Sidney Crosby's not having a really good season. All right? He's clearly the MVP of the Pittsburgh Penguins. There's just been better players than him this season. To put him at third, I think, is absurd. But anyway, that's me. Let's get to Daryl Ray. Now I'm going to put him at third. <laughs> you should put him at third. <laughs> because you said it's absurd. I'm going to put him absurd. at third. You should. And, like and, and Daryl Ray, Ray, our, our guest, would like that because we just made a rhyme. We did. The man with the best vocabulary in the NHL, Daryl Ray, joined us to talk about Dallas Stars hockey. Here's our interview with Razor. Razor, thanks so much for joining us. So we can see it. Sean and I can see it, but I got to point it out. Right behind you, you've got horns, and it looks you couldn't be more Texas right now. It looked like they're coming out of your head. It's fantastic. What a look. How you doing? Good. Uh, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the beat lab here, so... They're, they're not real. They're not real. I should have big longhorns though, instead of that. But whatever, all good. <laughs> well, listen, we'll we'll jump into this here. It's a great look. Uh, you got a lot of goalie stuff behind you too. A lot of old hockey stuff too, which is great. So the Dallas Stars. Here we are looking at this team. On February 29th, they were looking okay. Now, they've won 15 of 18 games since February 29th. The leap year's been good to them. What's been the difference? Uh, pr probably a little better focus. You know, they they went into the All-Star break, uh, which I know is a little predating that, but where Pete DeBoer wanted a, a, a better concentration on their defensive game. And he did a deep dive during the break just to figure out where they were deficient in that area. And they came out of it and for the most part have, have backed that up. I mean, they've, they've moved into the, 
I think in that span, the top five of NHL goals against, and that has not been the case this season. And they, they always proved that they can score goals and they could outscore their problems or deficiencies defensively. And, uh, and so that's in their back pocket all the time, but they, they understood if they're going to do anything serious in the spring, they're going to have to be a more well-rounded team and better defensively. And, you know, that's, it's an interesting thing with the stars because it's not, it's not just defending in their own zone. They, they look at it more as, you know, hanging on to pucks up ice, uh, what they do with the puck, you know, not turning it over. They they were a little sloppy from time to time and, and they'd end up chasing odd man rushes back into their own zone, kind of left their goaltending hung out to dry. And they've they've really tamped down on all of that. So you know, you look at the entire rink, what is it, seventeen uh thousand square feet? They're good in every area. The thing that amazed me as you're talking about that, like, look, this Dallas Stars team, we know who they are, right? There's a lot of veteran players on the team that everybody's familiar with. But for people who don't pay attention to this team, there's a lot of young blood that's been added into this team, you know, between Wyatt Johnson, uh, Harley on the back line, Stankhoven. Like, it's really hard with young players to do the things that you just said that Pete DeBoer is asking them to do. And I mentioned all those guys, and they've all had a huge part in this. They're not bit players. No, very, very much so. And they, they they have tremendous leadership here and good kids. You know, you sometimes you get the the mix where you're either you're either too moldy or too yeasty with your group. And the the stars are are neither. They're they're older guys. They're still everyday contributors. Um, you know, a guy like Joe Pavelski, even even Ryan Suter, although his minutes have have gone down a little bit, still plays every night. And both of them are pushing forty. And and Ryan, you know, he just eats minutes and does the right thing over and over again. And then you flip over to the kids, and you know, Wyatt Johnston has been incredible this year. He leads the team in goals. The other guy, Thomas Harley on defense, I think has made great strides. If you look at the hierarchy of this team, it's interesting to look at because you have these, you have this really old veteran group, you know, guys, 1400 games, 1300 games, over a thousand games. Tyler Sagan's approaching a thousand games. Uh, Matt Duchesne just played a thousand games. So you have that group. And then you have sort of the, the mid range, Still young, uh, but not as young as as the others. And I put all the 2017s in there: Ottinger, Haskinen, uh, Robertson. And then you add somebody like uh, Rope Hans into that group as well. So you have that group, and then you you dip down, and you have Stankov and Wyatt Johnston, Harley. I mean, it's a it's a pretty incredible kind of step after step the way this thing is constructed right now and and they're all contributors they're all expected to contribute and i think the young guys have made strides and the older veteran guys you can see them sort of ramping their game up as the as the playoffs approach they're they're quite a wagon right now you know and and what's interesting with that so i was looking again going back to that date february 29th i think they played winnipeg that night and it's been really good they were good before that let's be honest i mean but they they've been really good since then Uh The balance has been terrific, and the guy at the top of the scoring leaders in those last 18 games is Jamie Benn. Yeah. Jamie Benn's got 12 goals and 13 assists, 25 points in the last 18 games. What is it? And you just said the older guys are ramping it up. You, you'd think it'd be Rope. You'd think it'd be Robertson in that. And they're, they're in the mix, too, obviously. But what is it? What's Jamie been doing? What's his game looked like here? Again, I go back to what I said in the beginning. Like the the main thing is focus. Like he he seems to have a myopic focus on making sure that he is leading by example, playing the right way, and preparing himself, and in doing that, preparing the team for the Stanley Cup playoffs. They understand uh, that some of these guys aren't going to play till they're fifty. So the window, you know, the window is wide open, and it's right there for them right now. And the, the seriousness that that comes with that. And Jamie approaches it that way most of the time uh, anyway. And you couple that with the, the 
elevation of Stankoven from the American Hockey League when Dodonov was injured and and Tyler Sagan was injured. Stankoven came up. They played 21 games together now. Stankoven, Wyatt Johnston, and Jamie, and it's just mesh. They 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 play a style that is similar. All three guys are expected to hunt the puck and and turn it over, and they'll hang on to the puck. And when when you have a group that hangs on to the puck deep in the offensive zone and Jamie Ben's a part of that line, that's his game. You know, it was when it was Sagan, him and Radulov or Sagan, him and Nachushkin. You know, you look at those, those lines that he's played on, especially when he was really skipping along. And this one looks a lot like, like that. So that that's part of it. The other part would be the power play. Like he never, he, he had, almost zero impact on the Stars' power play from a goal-scoring standpoint for most of the season. And then in about that same time span you're speaking of, maybe expanded a little bit, he's he's refound his his touch there, scored some power play goals, shooting the puck as, as well as I've seen him uh, this season. And, uh, yeah, it, it just seems to all be in place for him right now, the confidence that comes with that. And that line is the that, – that is the line-tipping – trio for the stars as great as the top line with hints Robertson and Pavelski Duchesne Marchment and Sagan really drove things for this team for much of the first half of the season but if you look at it now with that line if, if you want to say they're coming out of the three hole they're really difficult for most teams to try to match up against so they get the advantage all, all the time they spend almost all their shifts in the offensive zone and uh I, I just another reason why the stars look like a serious contender to win it all. Yeah, well, there's been so many coaches that have been talked about this year that could be coach of the year, right? You look at it early on, it was Torts, Carberry's done such a good job with Washington. They're still in the playoff mix. Same thing with Lalonde. And then you got like Peter Laviolette leading leading the charge here. They've all been mentioned, and Peter Peter kind of slides under the the radar because he's been good for so long, right? He's brought so many teams to the conference final. What what is it about him? You're around him every day that makes him such a good coach. Personally, I think he should be in that top five for the Adams for what he's done with all the young kids that he's had. But when you when you look at him and you break him down on a on a nightly basis, what is it that makes him such a good coach? Maybe for this team specifically. Yeah, I mean, he should be. I I agree with you. Like, I, I always look at him, and he, he's he's the personification of the old old uh duck on the water right like it looks placid on the surface looks like there's not a lot of work going on and yet the legs are just kicking underneath the water to propel them around and when you look at Pete behind the bench like he's as stoic as any coach in the league he stands back there with his hands in the pocket uh, pockets a lot and a lot of the coaching is obviously done behind scenes and that taking it all in. He's really bright and he's not going to freak out on officials or anything else. And they make their adjustments between games, between periods, whatever. There's not, I don't know how many adjustments there are though, because I've always had great appreciation for those coaches that say, okay, this is the way we play and you're going to know how we play but you're not going to be able to do much about it because we're going to be so good at how we play that, that you can't match it and you can't handle it. And, and that's, that was the, the stars of the late nineties under Hitchcock in a very different style. And it's very much how Pete DeBoer goes about it too. I think they, they are, they are firm in what their details are and they're so good at it. Good luck to the other side. And they're deep. I found it amazing. Like they, the stars won their 50th game last night. That's, that's the first time in his very illustrious coaching career that he's ever won 50 games. You know, they probably should have done it last year, but they couldn't win in overtime. They ended up with 47 victories at the end of the season, but man, I, I have great appreciation for his professionalism and, and the style style is very modern. Uh, You know, they, they get giddy up out of their own zone and, on the attack and uh, if you're going to just, I guess, distill it down to its simplest form, a good offense is the best defense. And and that's kind of how they go about it. Chris Tanev has made an impact since he got to oh, Dallas. Yeah. 
Uh, what is it? What do you think? What do, What do you think the that what the ingredient that he's added? How essential has it been for this team? Puck, uh, puck movement. That like again, a lot of things with with this team and the way DeBoer, DeBoer wants them to play is predicated on how they get out of their own zone and how quickly they do. Like there's there's not a lot of dusting the puck off and D to D and hinge and all that. I mean, it is on a stick and it's gone and they have forwards flying the zone. So when you have somebody that can make a, a play, like everyone talked all the time for good reason too, about Tanev's goal suppression and his shot blocking and that. And we've seen that, uh, but he, he can move a puck and he has a history of whatever partner he is playing with. Usually there's a little bump in that player's offensive numbers a little, it, it hasn't quite manifested yet with Essel and Dell. They've, they've been primarily partners, but you can see lots of what you you're talking about. Like S S is getting chances that he wasn't before. So you, you drop in a guy who's a right shot, which they really needed, who could move a puck, who's so good at, at closing on teams defensively and individuals and just giving them no room to do what they want to do. And then he'll eat a puck to win a game. But Jake Ottinger was telling me yesterday when I was asking him about him, and he's like, he he cares about his goaltender more than maybe anybody he's ever played with because he's like, what do you need? What do you want? What can I do to help you? You know, he's always thinking first about making sure that the other team doesn't score. But when he does get the puck, he can make a play. It's not just bang it off the glass and out of the zone. So uh, he, he's been a, a perfect fit. One of those guys, you know, you see it at forward a lot where a guy will go out of the lineup, real important player. All of a sudden, guys are playing above their weight. and The lines don't look the same. And then you drop a guy in there again, and everything seems to fall into place. And he, to me, he's one of those individuals. I'm curious, and you'd know better than me. I've been around Chris a little bit. To say he's a little bit of a wild card, I think, is a fair statement, and I mean that in the nicest possible terms. He's a loose player personality-wise. It doesn't seem to me that Dallas has a lot of those. We talked about the young kids, and then we talked about the veterans who are somewhat serious, right, in in a good way. And and Chris is a very serious player, but he's also very funny, and he likes to be made fun of he's loose like how important is that to a team to me that seems like it it's a little tight in its culture that 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 is an excellent point i agree wholeheartedly like you need a little stupid cowboy in there somewhere right and you need an idiot yeah and and he's got a very dry sense of humor i you know he hasn't been here that long so i think everybody's still trying to kind of get used to one another and understand and that, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's got a warrior mentality and I I don't think he, I I think he's really self-deprecating from the times I've, I've talked to him and uh, they, yeah, they, they've got a a very professional, quiet, you know, the, the sort of core heart of the team are these Finns and you know what they're like, you know, with one another, they're all gregarious and everything, but they get outside of that and they're almost mute. They just work hard and play hockey and it, it's tough to get a lot out of them. Uh, they're captains that way. You know, Jamie isn't, isn't overboard gregarious and that. So yeah, I, I think he adds a, a big element of that. That's, that's necessary around here. We need an idiot on this podcast too. That's why we keep, we have two of them, Dan. <laughs> We we're we're constantly <laughs> vying for who's the biggest idiot. Yeah, that's true. Uh, all right, I want to ask you about two teams that, before we let you go, I want to ask you about two teams that Dallas has recently played here. They're contenders with them, Colorado and Edmonton. They beat them seven. They beat Colorado seven to four. They beat Edmonton five nothing. I mean, is Dallas that much better than these two teams? You know, the the game against Edmonton, it, it was, for whatever reason, the Oilers – top players get frustrated when they play Dallas. I don't, I don't know what it is, but, but they, they get really frustrated. Leon Dreisaitl has as many penalty minutes as he does assists against the stars in his career, um, which is, you know, goofy to even think of. Yeah. Uh, they, they just, I, 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 whatever it is that the stars have done and it's under 
a couple of different coaches, really. It's and two very different systems. Uh, but they they've they've struggled through the years to win against Dallas. Uh, they they just have, and maybe that frustration or or those losses have have caused some of the frustration in that game. It was a mismatch of decors. The the Stars' defense played phenomenal, and I don't know that the Oilers' crew could play much worse than they did in in that game. Like it was just, it was a rancid outing. Uh, you know, Darnell Nurse had a very forgettable game in that one. He's better than what he showed. Uh, but the, the Stars have have confidence that they they can handle teams that like to live on the rush and on the power play, and and they shut them down in that one and and scored enough to to win it going away. The game in Colorado, they they hadn't beaten the Avalanche in the season series, and they they had leads in every game. And the abs just keep coming at you, the, the, especially their top end. This, this was the first time the Stars had seen Colorado since the trade deadline. And, you know, a different look to them with the additions they had. There's just a, a deeper, a little bit nastier team to play against. Uh, but in, in that one, for whatever reason that, I mean, the abs, I know they had a big game last night out of McKinnon. Uh, to beat the wild, but they, they were in a bit of a rut and not playing that great. They got smoked by Edmonton before the game against the stars. And in that game, they lost Rantanen, which was a humongous omission on their side in, in a game like that. And you could see it, you know, a team that relies so heavily on, on their top end and you pull him out of there and they just didn't seem like the same, the same club in that one. Uh, and the, the stars depth just owned the game. And, and it was it, – look, it, it wasn't an easy game. They they played the day before in in Chicago and lost. Maybe that was the best thing that could have happened. They, yeah. they got beat by Mrazek and, and the Blackhawks. And, and they were – look, there's, there's no question they were overlooking the Hawks and looking forward to the meeting with the Avalanche and basically the Central Division on the line. And when they got into that game, their power play, which can be a major weapon, was they went three for three on the power play, and that was – really the biggest difference in the in the game that night the the previous games for whatever reason stars would be up and they could not keep the avalanche reined in and i mean they were up three nothing in one game and lost six to three so what what does it say about the potential matchup in the playoffs i don't know because both sides have uh, kind of clobbered the other side in some ways but if you look at the recent games the stars have played against the big boys in the west uh, they annihilated the Oilers on home ice. They spanked Colorado pretty good in Denver when they flew in the day of a game because of, of a travel snafu. And then when they went into Vancouver, they beat the Canucks and throttled them pretty good. They didn't have Thatcher Demko, but still they, they played great. So they're in these big matchups late in the season, they they've risen to the occasion and, and that has to give them a little bit of confidence rolling into the postseason. Yeah, I, I would assume they're going to be one of the true battleships of of the playoffs this year, and and the West is loaded with them. We're looking forward to to seeing how it all plays out. We're looking forward to hearing your calls, and we really appreciate you joining us today on the podcast. Thanks a lot. All right, you guys keep vying for idiot of the day. Okay, yeah. you're one and two right now. You're yeah. neck and neck, neck and neck. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoyed it. All right, Sean, great stuff there with Razor. I I will say one. We haven't we didn't talk to him at all about Jake Ottinger, who also has been terrific for the Dallas Stars in this run. And I keep going back to that date, February 29th. That's you know, they, they stopped the losing streak there. They've started a hot streak. 15 of their last 18 games have been wins since then. And Ottinger in that stretch has won 12 of them. 909 save percentage a 238 goals against and two shutouts. He was a, it was struggle for Jake Ottinger for a while this season. And I think part of the reason they were defensively deficient, as Razor talked about with DeBoer doing a breakdown of it around All-Star Weekend, was the goalie wasn't making the saves that he was making last season. And now he is. For the most part, he's been really good. And Ottinger has been a big part of this. So top to bottom, I I really love this Dallas Stars team with the way they're playing and if the goalie can play this way too. Yeah, it's a little chicken or egg. You know, is he making the saves because he's better or is he making the saves because the stars are better? Um, 
you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is. He certainly looks more confident, which is good for them. He looks more like the goalie, you know, who stole them some games in their deep runs in the playoffs. And, and you know, if you don't have a hot goalie going into the playoffs, you're in a lot of trouble. And I, I look at the Dallas Stars, and there's very few teams that I would say in the West have a better goalie than Jake yeah. Ottinger. And that's huge for as talented as they are. And I, and I have to say, Daryl's a good salesman because he sold me on the stars a little bit more. I still think it's Colorado. Obviously that win that Dallas had this week and and the way that they were able to do it scares me a little bit in, in, in holding that opinion. Um, but I do just playoff tested, you know, dominating players. I, I think Colorado is, is the better team, but Ottinger is a better goalie than than anything Colorado can put against him um you know Georgiev for all the wins he has hasn't put up the numbers that Ottinger is putting up right now so that scares me a little bit and I honestly think that those two teams in the central are probably the monsters in in the west right Vancouver's been very middling for Mm. a month for a while now yeah part of it is without Thatcher Demko who practiced this week and is hopefully coming back but with a goalie and a lower body injury you never have any idea how they're going to come back what they're going to do and let's not forget Connor McDavid's dealing with an injury again now in Edmonton you know he's day to day with a lower body injury they say it's not the same injury that bothered him at the beginning of the season when he was a mediocre player missed a couple of games and much like Alex Ovechkin was struggling to a degree before he took off and became a huge part of this MVP race um, and, and you know, carried Edmonton to crazy heights um, that they're at now where, you know, the playoffs look like a, a pipe dream and now, you know, they're already clinched and they're just fighting for position. So I, I really, as the days go by, this Dallas team is growing on me more and more. Listen, I picked him to win the Stanley Cup the start of the year. I'm liking that pick a lot right now. I also, I picked them to play against Carolina in the Stanley Cup final. That looks okay. Right. I mean, Carolina's looking really good right now. So toot my own horn a little bit there. But no, I really like Dallas. I do. Yeah. Dan, you are the smartest hockey man that I know. Appreciate that, Sean. Thank you very much. You're you're not the idiot. Nope, I'm the not, idiot. Not right now. Yes. I am the idiot with my absurd takes. But let me just mention this. As I mentioned to Daryl, every entity needs an idiot because let's not forget. This is the 20-year anniversary of a bunch of idiots making history. Yeah. And that was the 2004 Red Sox. They celebrated yesterday, opening yep. day in Fenway. All the idiots All right. were back together, and it was awesome. So I'll live with being an idiot. They only made history because they hadn't won the World Series in a thousand years. That's no, they I only made history because they came back from 03. Yeah, yeah, I know. And against the Yankees, so I'm all for it. So that's good. (laughs) Hey, that was my favorite team at the time right then in that series. I'll I'll tell you that much. Anyway, listen, one team we didn't mention right there, Winnipeg. What about Winnipeg, Sean? Like, I was asked a question in my mailbag this week. Of the four Canadian teams that are making the playoffs this year, which one has the best chance to win the Stanley Cup? Be the first Canadian team to win the Stanley Cup since 1993. My answer is Winnipeg, and it's for two simple reasons unquestioned reasons if you ask me they have the best goalie of the four teams they have the best and most sure thing goalie obviously the four teams are winnipeg vancouver toronto and edmonton right they have the best goalie connor hellebuck they might have the best goalie going into the playoffs of any team in the playoffs or at very least of any team in the western conference they play the best five on five defense they're allowing one and a half goals per game at five on five so even if their penalty kill is not that great If they keep up this five-on-five defense, they'll win a lot of games in the playoffs. And we know that the playoffs become more of a five-on-five game than a special teams game for the most part. Special teams still play a big role, but five-on-five is huge in the playoffs. And the Winnipeg Jets are the best five-on-five team right now in the league. 117 goals against at five-on-five. So, yeah, I actually will tell you that I think the Winnipeg Jets have a better chance than a team like the Colorado Avalanche. And that will be a first-round matchup, and I probably would pick the Winnipeg Jets to win that series. Connor Hellebuck makes the big difference. Their defense makes the big difference. One thing they got to do is they got to find a way to slow down a guy who is impossible to slow down. 
Nathan McKinnon. But if you can at least limit that, let him score the one and a half five on five goals per game and then stop everybody else, you can win. But McKinnon, Sean, proved in their game against the Minnesota Wild on Tuesday night why he is the Hart Trophy winner this season. He absolutely took over that game and did things that no one else can do. Well, I agree with that. And I also agree with Winnipeg being the best Canadian team or the best chance to win a Stanley Cup among the Canadian teams, which means that the streak is going to continue of no Probably. Canadian teams winning the cup because <laughs> I don't believe as good as the Winnipeg Jets are that they're a Stanley Cup champion. I don't believe they're of that caliber. And and I find it humorous that you think that they can beat Colorado when you just talked about their inability to play penalty kill. Well, it's not an inability to play penalty When you kill. have to go up against that power play. And you just talked about how good Nathan McKinnon is. Yeah, like, he's really good. Yeah. So that series might be a pick em, but I don't think I can pick Winnipeg. All right. Listen, I don't like the the Avalanche goaltending situation right now. It, it is it, it, it's throwing me off for the Avalanche in general, to be honest with you. It, it really is. It's they're it, it's it's a detriment to them right now. Maybe it becomes a plus, but I'll give you another important factor in this too, Sean. The penalty kill for the Winnipeg Jets is about seventy eight percent, but they have had the among teams going that we know for sure that are going to the playoffs right now. Let's just say in the West, right? Vegas is going to make the playoffs. They're second fewest in shorthanded. Uh, total times shorthanded, right? So they're not a penalty-based team. Vegas has fewer shorthanded, uh, fewer times on the penalty kill than Winnipeg does. Then there's Winnipeg among the other teams in the West. They don't go on the PK a ton. They're not great on it, but they do limit their penalties. They're a disciplined team. So I, I don't know that they're Stanley Cup ready, but with the defense, well, with the goaltending I see from Colorado... That doesn't look to me like it's Stanley Cup ready either. Now, I probably was thinking the same thing in 2022 when they had Darcy Kemper in net, and they went out and they won the Stanley Cup with Darcy Kemper in net. So anything can ha- it can happen for sure. But I, I think I'm going to pull the upset special there and, and pick Winnipeg uh, to beat Colorado in that series if it happens. Well, I think we'll be getting to our picks next week. Bob Bender, our producer, would know better, but uh, we're looking at the end of the season soon and the playoffs starting after that, so I would assume next week is the big pick-a-palooza. Um, so we'll we'll return to this. But the other point that you were making, and I think you were trying to segue into an MVP conversation aside from my crazy Sidney Crosby. Poorly. I was poorly uh, segueing. Yeah, and uh, aside from my <laughs> Sidney Crosby craziness in the first segment, I think you're trying to swing into an MVP conversation and you emphatically stated that McKinnon is the MVP. And I don't know how much of a segment we can have because I emphatically believe that Nathan McKinnon is the MVP as well. Although watching Kucherov this weekend in that game against Pittsburgh, how like that guy could do anything he wants. He's the MVP and he does have like 50, two points more than Braden Point, I want to say, which is just bazonkers. But I still think Nathan McKinnon is more valuable. He takes over a game, right? I mean, Kucherov's an artist, and maybe nobody does it help. He needs help to take over a game. Yes, that's exactly right. McKinnon, what he did against Minnesota is a perfect example of why he doesn't need help. It's the burst of acceleration before the burst of acceleration, it's reading the play, where the puck is going, to know that he can have his burst. He gets his burst, the puck gets to him, and he's gone. You can't stop him. And not just is he gone, he's not flying. Remember Michael Grabner used to get tons of breakaways, right? And my, and he was flying up and down the ice. He would never score on him because he had no finish or any ability. It's not, McKinnon is flying up and down the ice. He gets the puck, He busts through defensemen, and then he's got a perfect finish. He's got a great finishing touch to him as well. It's it's unstoppable. Uh, and, and 
it's the way he takes over games. Your exact point, your point is spot on. Kucherov, as great as he is, and my God, is he great? He needs help to take over a game because he's an artist. He's passing the puck. He's looking for guys. His pass to Stamkos last night for a one-timer across the ice, perfect. His pass to Braden Point, blind almost, spinning in the offense of his own, right on his stick, perfect. But those are moments that the artistry comes out. McKinnon's a wrecking ball, and he wrecks games. He, re- he It's just the way he does it, and that's why I think he's the guy. Like, And I... I, I I understand the Kucherov part of the debate, and it, and it seems like you want to like, it seems like a knock on Kucherov. It's not. It's just that this guy McKinnon is doing things right now that nobody else is doing, and that's why he's the guy for me. He's a one man show, so we can't argue about this. But I think I, I I found something that we can maybe have a little debate about. Okay. So Kucherov's in the MVP conversation. McDavid's in the MVP conversation. Each of them could have a hundred assists before. The season's over. Well, yes, both of them. Yeah, yes, each of them. That's Kucherov the is four away. McKinnon, McDavid, one away. Yeah, so Kucherov can do that in one game. He's had multiple yes. three assist games in the last week, and each of them is the proper grammatical way to do it. Um, but here's my question for you: a hundred assists or seventy goals? which is what Austin Matthews is coming up on. He scored 60, number 66 last night against the New Jersey Devils, who blew another lead, by the way. Not that it matters anymore because they're out, but I've never seen a team blow that many leads. But anyways, 66 goals. He's got an outside chance at 70. 66 is the most since, since Ovechkin scored 65. Um, which one's more impressive, 70 goals or 100 assists? 70 goals. Then we can have an argument. Okay. So I say 70 goals is more impressive because goal scoring in general might be the hardest thing to do in the game, okay? And if you're going to be able to do it, we've had this conversation before. If you can do it 70 times in an 82-game season, it's a remarkable achievement. Now, 100 assists is terrific, but a lot. how many of those are secondary assists? How many of those are the play before the play? When you get the puck from the guy who's getting the assist, you still have to put it into a small area to get it past an elite goaltender. And every single one of the goaltenders in the National Hockey League is elite. You have to find very small space every single time to put it in unless it's an empty net goal, right? And Austin Matthews does it on a routine basis basis his shot his release is imp- is is the best in the game maybe maybe the best in the league since Brendan Shanahan's release right and Shanahan had an unreal release and to do it 70 times Sean to find to put that puck into a very small opening and find the hole it's incredible so it's 70 it's 70 goals because how many of those assists are secondary the play before the play It doesn't matter primary or secondary. Here's the reason why the assists are more unbelievable to me. First, look at the assist totals for this season. McDavid has 99. Kucherov has 96. Nathan McKinnon, who's going to be the MVP, has 86. Then it's Quinn Hughes at 71. Panarin at 70. You're talking about 29 assists. That's almost 25% more assists that these guys are scoring than other unbelievably elite players. And the only people that have ever done it in the game are Mario, Wayne, and Bobby Orr. When did those guys play? Yeah, I understand. Where's the modern guy that's done that? Where's the guy who's been playing three to two, four to three games, put up 100 assists? He doesn't exist. All right. This has never been this has never been seen in the game that we know. Not the game that we've watched in highlights and we've studied and maybe we remember as little kids cuz I'm an old man and and I do remember some of that in the game that we have embraced and we've watched since we were old enough to understand it and break it down. Where's that guy? Brett Hall never I'm- did it. Adam Oates never did it. Uh, Brett Hall is a bad example. I was thinking of Adam Oates. Yeah, like, I understand, understand. 
They never did it. They were the greatest pastors we've ever seen. They never did it. In 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 an era when there were 13 goals scored a game. All right. Yes, it's remarkable. I'm going to throw this. We have Before we end this, I'm going to throw this one thing out at you as well. Why 70 is more impressive. And it's not even the number 70. It's the number 50. Austin Matthews, his next even strength goal will be his 50th even strength goal of this season. He's not doing it on the power play as much. He is, He's doing it on at even strength more than anything. And the last guy to score 50 even strength goals was Timo Solani in 92-93. Gretzky did it a few times. Phil Esposito. So you're talking about 100 assists and how few guys have done it. I'm going to give you that number. 50 even strength goals in a season. And that'll get Matthews to 70. This season. It, it, it could get him to 70, right? So I think it's 70. It's the hardest thing to do. You think it's 100 assists. Absurd again. But, you know, I mean, it's the way it goes sometimes. I'm right a lot in this episode. You're right a lot always. <laughs> that's that's what I've 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 learned um in all of this is that you're right and then things happen and I'm right. So you're right beforehand <laughs> and then they actually play the games that we've talked about and I'm right. In in the rearview mirror and even you go back and play the start of this Sean I have to give you credit again you were 100% right. And by the way, the Nashville Predators qualified for the playoffs this week. Our Bob, our producer, is just going to clip the part where Sean, Sean says, you are right, Dan. That's all I want to hear. Listen, this was a lot of fun. He's, he's going to put it up on X2 just so we can, f- we can feed your ego. All right. Stop talking. This was a lot of fun. <laughs> Razor was great. Uh, we've got very little time left in this regular season. This East race is really good. The President's Trophy race, first place on the line in a few divisions as well. We'll talk again next week. Enjoy the hockey.